A price bump at the pump today. The major improvements funded by California's gas tax hike. No warnings on another sewage spill near Imperial Beach. The communication problem for authorities on both sides of the border. I remember the first Pioneer laser disc. Every week it seemed like there was a new disc, and so every week we'd try the new disc. Playing to the crowd, the cultural icon in the Pacific Northwest that transforms anybody into a karaoke star. KPBS Evening Edition starts right now. Good evening and thanks for joining us. I'm Ebony Monet. The deadly truck attack in New York City is officially a case of terrorism. The suspect, Saifullo Saipov, was formally charged this afternoon and appeared in federal court. He did not enter a plea. Saipov was in a wheelchair after being shot by police. In court documents, prosecutors say he asked to hang the ISIS flag in his hospital room. Eight people were killed in Tuesday's attack, 11 injured. Today, White House spokesperson Sarah Huckabee Sanders said the administration considers the suspect an, an enemy combatant. During a cabinet meeting, President Donald Trump called for an end to the immigration program the suspect used to enter the U.S. in 2010. I am today starting the process of terminating the diversity lottery program. I am going to ask Congress to immediately initiate work to get rid of this program, diversity and diversity lottery. Diversity lottery sounds nice. It's not nice. It's not good. It's not good. It hasn't been good. We've been against it. President Trump is also calling for quicker, stronger justice in the court system. He suggests he would be open to sending the suspect to Guantanamo Bay detention camp. The suspect, seen here in unrelated prior police photos, was originally from Uzbekistan. He moved to New Jersey several months ago. NYPD says he had been planning the attack for weeks, but was not part of any prior investigation. Neighbors of the suspect say they've seen him in the truck similar to the one used in the attack. The same truck, same model. How, and how long have you seen that truck around? I've been seeing it on and off for three weeks. For three weeks? Yeah. So he's had it for three yeah, weeks? Yeah, multiple times. PBS NewsHour will have in-depth coverage of the attack in New York, including the latest on the investigation, the victims, and the debate on immigration. That airs tonight at 7. San Diego City Councilman Chris Kate is fighting an effort to place him under oath and testify about his leak of a confidential city memo. KPBS Metro reporter Andrew Bowen has more. Kate was served a subpoena last month as part of a lawsuit over the memo the councilman leaked. The lawyer behind the lawsuit wants Kate to give a sworn deposition on how and why he gave the memo to a lobbyist for the Soccer City initiative. That initiative seeks to redevelop the former Chargers Stadium in Mission Valley into a pro soccer stadium, housing, commercial space and a river park. The memo from the city attorney's office talks about various legal challenges Soccer City might face if it's approved by voters next year. One month ago, Kate held a press conference admitting he gave the confidential memo about Soccer City to a Soccer City lobbyist. He said he did so to get the lobbyist's input ahead of a city council vote on Soccer City a few days later. Now back to the lawsuit. Kate's lawyers objected to the subpoena, saying it was unnecessary. So the lawyer suing the city is asking a good judge to force Kate to give a deposition. The judge will hear that motion in January. For more on this story, go to kpbs.org. Andrew Bowen, KPBS News. After more than a year of iNews source stories on the topic, the San Diego Rules Committee today firmed up a law that mandates everyone doing business with the city disclose the financial interest behind the deal. iNews source reporter Brad Racino has more. The Rules Committee's unanimous vote today cleared up the language around Section 225, a law approved by voters more than 25 years ago but rarely enforced. 
At its core, Section 225 of the City Charter requires that people, corporations, limited liability companies, and other entities not only disclose their names when entering into deals with the city, but also the names of the people who stand to benefit from the transaction. For example, if the city sold land to Company A, it couldn't simply list another corporation, say Company B, as the owner and call it a day. Instead, Section 225 mandates Company A disclose the names of the people behind Company B. This is important because San Diego now contracts with more than 1,000 companies each year, and those contracts collectively are worth more than a billion dollars. As time has proven, taxpayers and local leaders need to know who is behind those deals. Part of the reason Section 225 hasn't been enforced since voters overwhelmingly approved it in 1992 is because the language that defines it is so vague. The Rules Committee's vote cleared up that vague language by adding a new section to the Municipal Code, which will go before the full council for approval at its next meeting. The Municipal Code is different than the City Charter, which requires a public vote to change. That's set to take place in November 2018. Wednesday's action is a temporary solution and will be automatically repealed once the Charter vote happens. For KPBS, I'm iNewsource reporter Brad Racino. iNewsource is an independently funded nonprofit partner of KPBS. For more on this new law, go to inewsource.org 225. California's gas taxes will go up today, 12 cents for a gallon of regular, 20 cents for diesel. The increase was signed into law in April by Governor Jerry Brown. The revenue from the tax increase will be used to repair roads, highways and bridges and improve public transportation. Joanna Figueroa lives in El Cajon and she's not looking forward to paying the extra 12 cents a gallon. Well, if you can see what I drive, that affects me as a single mom. It's really hard and it's very very expensive so for normal people with little cars it's like $23 when compared to me it's like $60 every week so it cuts into your check a lot this is paid for by my work. Nicole Warner from San Diego says her mom reminded her to fill up before the tax took effect today she says she understands the cost to fix the state's roads it cost to fix the state's roads pros and cons I mean someone's got to pay for it and since I do use the road, I guess I should have to contribute to that, to be honest. But it's not going to be easy. No, no. It will probably reflect in my, my extra spending money will go a little bit further down. I won't have as much freedom. Many Republicans at the state capitol oppose the new tax. They say higher gas prices will affect the price of food and other goods. And they're looking ahead to more cost increases in the new year. Many Californians are just finding out about this increase. They will start to learn as they see their gas prices go up at the pump. But the pain is not over, unfortunately, because January 1st, they will get hit with car registration fee increases. So if you own a car in the state of California, your car registration will go up by up to $175 come January 1st. Some Republican state lawmakers are looking to repeal the new tax. There are two ballot initiatives in the works for 2018. Another cross-border sewage spill fouled ocean waters off southern San Diego County last week. And local officials say there was no warning from Mexican officials. KPBS reporter Eric Anderson has the story. Imperial Beach officials say the stench from the spill permeated the beach last Friday. Officials even saw human waste in the surf line. Now, water quality tests just south of the U.S.-Mexico border confirmed that there were high levels of contamination. Imperial Beach Mayor Serge Dedina says he even got sick from surfing in the ocean that week. And Dedina says that happened without warnings from Mexico or warnings from health agencies on this side of the border. There's a significant problem. We're not asking for advanced infrastructure. We're just asking for inf infrastructure to stop the continual spill of toxic waste and toxic sewage into the Tijuana River Valley. Over 320 spills alone in the last two years, not counting what's going on at playas. Um, that has a significant impact on public health and economic development in both Tijuana and um, Imperial Beach. Now, federal officials on the U.S. side of the border promised better cross-border communication after more than 200 million gallons of untreated sewage flowed through the Tijuana River Valley this past winter. Those same federal officials say they reached out to Mexican officials to ask whether a spill had occurred, but they say the Mexican official response was that there was nothing that had happened. Eric Anderson, KPBS News. 
A Navy report issued today implicates the crews of the USS McCain and USS Fitzgerald for two recent collisions which led to the deaths of 17 sailors this summer. KPBS military reporter Steve Walsh has been following the case. He has this report. In some ways, the report uh, states the obvious. Crews on each of the two destroyers could have and probably should have avoided collisions with commercial vessels that led to the death of 17 sailors in the Pacific. The Navy found a series of small errors and lack of basic seamanship led to the Fitzgerald colliding with a container ship in June. Among other things, the commander of the USS McCain ignored recommendations to place sailors on watch prior to the collision uh, with a tanker in August. Chief of Naval Operations Admiral John Richardson released a statement saying, the Navy is firmly committed to doing everything possible to prevent an accident like this from happening again. A separate report is set to be released tomorrow. It is expected to show that the problems of poor training and fatigue aren't isolated to the two destroyers. Changes are likely to impact U.S. naval vessels around the world, including in San Diego. Steve Walsh, KPBS News. A San Ysidro school board member called today for the district's interim superintendent to resign, saying he had deceived the school trustees about financial perks the board had approved for him and his predecessor, Julio Fonseca. Julio Fonseca. I News Source reporter Leonardo Castaneda has details. Trustee Rodolfo Linares said today that both the interim and former superintendents for the San Ysidro School District deceived the board when they cashed out excessive vacation days and received payouts for deferred term life insurance. This comes after a news source revealed the last month that the district paid ex-superintendent Julio Fonseca at least $1 million for 26 months of work. That averaged out to make him the highest paid superintendent in the county and the second highest paid in the state. Here's what Linares had to say. We were mani <coughs> manipulated by our most trusted administrators who use their position of authority to steal hundreds of thousands of dollars from our students. With the information I have put together, I now have to be the whistleblower on the illegal actions of both Julio Fonseca and Arturo Sanchez Macias. Linares wants both men to return that deferred life insurance and vacation pay. He also called for a forensic audit of the district. Either you stand against these illegal acts or we are complicit in them. We tried to speak with Fonseca and Sanchez Macias, but neither replied. A San Isidro spokesman said these allegations will not distract the district from its mission of educating students. Late this afternoon, two trustees announced the board will hold a special meeting this Friday to talk about all of this. For KPBS, I'm my news reporter, Leonardo Castaneda. If you need health insurance through Covered California, the time to sign up is now. This is the first day of open enrollment. President Trump has pulled subsidies for low-income people covered by the Affordable Care Act and is pulling back on advertising this year. The executive director of Covered California says the move won't have much of an effect in our state and describes our exchange as stable. Kitchen table discussions are about getting health care now. Washington, it's going to take time to do things, and we're going to keep people apprised of what they need to know. 400,000 new enrollees are expected to sign up during the open enrollment period. The deadline is January 31st or December 15th if you want the coverage to start on January 1st. By the year 2030, more than 20 percent of Americans will be seniors. While many people want to stay home to keep their independence, it's not always that easy. From WGBH in Boston, reporter Christina Quinn introduces us to Northeastern University researchers who are working on a solution. On the fourth floor of Richards Hall on Northeastern University's campus in Boston, Christine Gordon gives me a tour of the lab she manages. So welcome to NU Home, or New Home. Uh, this is our laboratory at Northeastern University. It is illustrative of what an older, independently living adult might be living in. Fully equipped with devices, cameras, and sensors, this smart home is designed to monitor your movements and remind you when to take your meds, coach you through workouts, and even track how often you're brushing and flossing. The big picture is to allow people to age in place or to rehabilitate in place, because we know that the health outcomes for individuals who are in the home are generally better than those that are institutionalized. And as the population of seniors doubles over the next 30 years, the number of caregivers will take a nosedive, opening up the demand for virtual caregiving. 
While a lot of technology they use already exists, the new home team is developing its own devices. This is a prototype of a smart cane. It's not the prettiest thing, but it does measure balance and gait speed. So just by using something as simple as a cane, we're able to learn a lot about not just their habits and where they might be in the home, but also the status of their health. The new home team is also working on ways to send information from devices like this to a family member or alert your physician's office when necessary. Holly Jimison, co-creator of New Home, envisions doctors will prescribe patients with devices and plants tailored to their individual needs and conditions. In the same way they would go get a prescription filled at the drugstore, these kits could be available with the right modules inside, all the sensors required. But these devices are not cheap. Some would even argue they're a luxury. Even so, Lori Orlov, founder of Aging in Place Technology Watch, says insurers might be willing to foot the bill. It's always feasible to have something medically reimbursed if it in, in fact provides a value that reduces the likelihood, for example, of a person being readmitted to the hospital. The other interesting uh, aspect of this is the need for commercializing technology. Um, I believe that research projects that create prototypes that are useful for an older adult market need to simultaneously find partners who will bring them into commercial reality. For Holly Jimison, the ultimate goal is integrating all these technologies and using that information to better inform physicians and caretakers. I think much of it is here and now, but it's not coordinated. You know, people will have an app for this, an app for that, and nothing is pulled together and integrated into your daily lives. And if integrating these sensors and devices means living independently longer, aging in place just might become a little easier. <laughs> I'm Judy Woodruff on the next news hour on the leading edge of science. We revisit the impact of Hurricane Sandy five years later. That's Wednesday on the PBS News Hour. Winter weather is coming sooner than expected. Erin Calandra has more in tonight's forecast. Good evening, I'm AccuWeather's Erin Calandra. Hopefully you all had a fantastic day today. It's pretty quiet around the county. Maybe a couple brief pop-up showers in places, but a majority of us really stayed dry today. We do have a system to the north of us that's bringing cooler temperatures, a wintry mix, some snow in some places, also some rain. It is inching to the south. It's going to reach us toward the end of the weekend. So for tonight, 61 degrees. It's going to be cloudy out there, especially along the coast here. It's going to take some time for that fog to burn off. Temperatures Oceanside tonight, 55 degrees. San Diego, 61. Ramona, 51. Borrego Springs, 57. And Mount Laguna, 43 degrees for our overnight lows. Here we are on Thursday. Uh, here we see some snow to the north of us. We have this cool breeze coming in off the coast, so it's going to keep much of the California coast a bit cloudy and also a lot cooler. San Diego County tomorrow, our highs are right around average to a couple degrees below. So Oceanside 70, San Diego 70, Poway 72 degrees, Alpine 66, Chula Vista coming in at 69 degrees, and Mount Laguna 55, Ramona 67 degrees. Here we are with this big wintry mix. We're seeing snow, a mix of ice and rain, and then to the Midwest, it's just kind of a rainy pattern here. This is going to inch its way down to the south by this weekend. We are going to see some rain showers in places. So through the next couple of days, it's going to be mostly sunny. Temperatures at 70 degrees. And then on Monday, those showers move in 69 degrees. Inland, same story, mostly sunny in the mid-70s to low 70s. Monday, those showers move in 76 degrees for the temperature in the mountains. Thursday through Sunday. It's going to be a bit cloudy at times. Temperatures in the 50s. And on Monday, those showers move in. 57 for the high. And here we are in the deserts. It's going to stay dry here, but on Monday, it will become cloudy. Temperatures much warmer in the upper 70s to low 80s. For KPBS News, I'm Erin Calandra. Bush Garden has been open since 1953. It's Seattle's oldest karaoke bar. Now the older, somewhat rundown building the bar is housed in has been sold. A Spark Media media producer Sarah Strunnan says now Seattle faces losing another beloved cultural icon. I'm 
Chris, and I host karaoke every Wednesday night here at Bush Garden. Karaoke here is almost like a religious experience. Where else do we get together in public social life and sing together? The first time I met Karen was here as a customer at the bar. She got up on stage and just started like laying down no diggity, like nothing. And I was like, whoa, this woman is incredibly awesome. She's like the heart of this place, certainly. My name is Karen Akata Sakata. My husband and I are the, the owners of Bush Garden. For me, my memories go back to when we were, we were kids. There were no big hotels yet in Seattle, so this is a place where Japan Airlines had their events upstairs. A lot of the community nonprofits would hold their fundraising events upstairs. After weddings, after funerals, um, this was just a place where people came. We are the first place that started American or you know, English karaoke. I remember the first Pioneer laser disc. Every week it seemed like there was a new disc, and so every week we'd try the new disc. We live in a world, I think, where we're constantly disciplined and not saying, not, you know, like to sit in our seats and be quiet and socialize with strangers in very rigid ways. And so there's something really cathartic about watching somebody shed all of that in a moment and then be rewarded by this audience that is just like super supportive and cheering them on. All right, Tia, yeah, it's your turn. The best times are when there's something that's, you know, in the air and everybody is listening. The whole room is singing the same song and, you know, the vibrations that come from that, the good, good feeling. Uh, I'm third generation coming down to Bush Garden. It means a lot to me just knowing what, what, what the history behind this place is. This is a place where I can be I can be happy. This is a place where I can sing my heart out, see great people. I can learn more about the community through Karen and everybody else. Everybody comes to have fun because this is their favorite place. We think about uh, our youth or being a young person in the world as a time where we're friends and we socialize with young people. But it, this place proves that it, does, it need not be that way, right? Like we actually can hang out with Shirley back there, the bartender, or like, you know, I don't know, Uncle Gino. And it's not weird actually at all. And they all drink here too, so it's really, <laughs> it's simpatico. <laughs> It's gonna be a hole. It's gonna be, you know, where do I go? Where do I, just the place you go to where you know you're gonna see people you know, you know you're gonna see people, you know, your friends, where, where, do, we, where do we collect? So knowing that this place is, has an expiration date on it is bittersweet. The people of Bush Garden have been more appreciative and more grateful towards each other in the last moments of its life. It's, I don't think you'll find those kinds of communities in these uh, cookie cutter, I don't know, establishments that people are building in the city nowadays. They're not designed for people, they're designed for customers and revenue. What I worry about, you know, kind of in more bigger picture is keeping the idea as a community. I know that a lot of other communities are slowly changing. It's the people that come in, it's the people that work here that make it Bush Garden. It's not made by myself. I think it would just keep on going even if I wasn't here. They're sharing their lives here and, um, and, and bringing the spirit, you know, keeping the spirit of the community, keeping the recognition of the people before us. I never would have thought when I was a kid working here that I would have ever been here in this place doing this. So, you know, just, you know, thank you for um, letting me be a part of it too.
That story comes to us from Spark Public Media in Seattle. The Bush Garden restaurant has closed, but the bar remains open for now. The developers who currently own the building have promised to give the Bush Garden owners, bar gar owners, a two-month notice before they're required to vacate. We're gonna win this, baby! Los Angeles Dodger fans are pumped after last night's win and going into tonight's final game of the World Series with the home field advantage over the Houston Astros. It's been a while since the Dodgers last won the title, nearly 30 years, even longer for the Astros. If they win tonight, it will be the first World Series title for Houston ever. Now, here's a look at what we're working on for tomorrow in the KPBS newsroom. On Morning Edition, the debate over Al Cajon's strategy to fight hepatitis A and homelessness. And on Midday Edition, the new bosses of gambling in America. The San Diego editor behind Gangsters to Governors. That's tomorrow on KPBS Radio. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash Evening Edition. Thanks for joining us and have a great night.